maintaining relations with the tenants. This is very hard. Well, actually, this section, what I mean by that is because your client is where your loyalties lie. However, you may have a relationship that you have struck up over the years with a tenant living in your client's property. I'm here to tell you right now, I have managed properties. I still manage a couple of properties where I have met the tenant personally probably 100 times more than I've met my client. In all honesty, I have physically met my client one time. He lives in California. The day he hired our company, he was here in Indiana. We met and we formed a bond. Ever since then, everything has been done on the phone and I typically talk to him once a month, twice a month, but I may talk to his tenants every other day that call for something. So it is good that you make sure that you establish some sort of relationship so that you can make sure that you are giving good communication, that you are enforcing all the standards and all the terms of the lease and getting the maintenance done in time and keeping the accurate records. So you will interact with a tenant maybe more than the person who you actually have the loyalty to. And that that's where I say it can get hard. I've got one tenant that has been in uh, Amir's property now seven years. I know her children. They've now graduated high school. I know their dog's names. I know all of that. But understand that look, my loyalty does not lie to them. My loyalty lies to Amir. So if there's issues, I really don't listen to her. I kind of got to call him and go, hey, dude, there's a hot water heater. She would like a new hot water heater. What do you think? And he's like, no, no, no. I think we can get it fixed for half the price. Get me a quote on uh, uh, fixing the water heater, even though she's the one I talk to on a daily basis. Another thing that you're going to be liable for is going to be maintaining the property. And I'm here to tell you that a maintenance program will either make or break your property management company because the lack of maintenance or the delay in maintenance will soon get out that you are a terrible property manager where the other side of that is, hey, I called, they were there the next day, or they came there that evening because it was an emergency. So make sure that you have a great maintenance plan. And when it comes to maintenance, there are a couple different types of maintenance that you will be in charge for. The first one is called preventative maintenance. Preventative maintenance are things that you might do to a structure to prevent some large catra catastrophe. A great example of preventative maintenance is changing the air filters on the HVAC unit. You may do that every month when you go and collect uh, your rent. You may do it every quarter. The point being, it's something that you do to try and prevent that HVAC unit from breaking down. Because if it breaks down, you get to do the second maintenance, which is called corrective maintenance or repair. This is where you have to fix whatever's broken. The hot water heater broke and I no longer have hot water. Or the furnace is out. Maybe it's because you didn't change the filter. So you can see where the preventative maintenance could be a crucial component in the repair maintenance. In one of my commercial spaces, inside of my commercial lease, there is actually a requirement for me to have a physical inspection 
of my HVAC system every quarter. And when that company comes every quarter and inspects my HVAC unit, they give me a report and they copy the landlord on that report. So it can be that serious where they put it inside of your lease. Then we have these things called routine maintenance. This is going to be something that you would do on a daily basis. Maybe it's vacuuming the carpet in the common area of your apartment building. All right. That would be routine maintenance. Now, there is another one right here that is called tenant improvement or the slang that you hear for this is TI. This is typically what's called construction. Construction. In the commercial world, construction or tenant improvement is almost always done by whom? I'll let you think about that because there's a key here. What's it called? Tenant improvement. So who does it? The tenant does. Another word that you hear for this sometimes is called build out. A commercial tenant typically is responsible for their own build out because a subway is going to look different than a Walden bookstore. So the landlord doesn't do that. Hey, I don't know what you want. Do you want offices? Or do you want like one of my spaces is just one open area that I use for teaching live classes. So that's a classroom environment. He's going to say, I don't know. How do you want that to look? Do you want a desk up here? Do you want the desk in the back? Do you want the? So typically when the commercial tenant rents the space, they will do tenant improvement and build out the interior to look like they want. My second unit that's beside it is the admin office to my brokerage, to my mortgage, and to the school. It is virtually the same size. It's the same square footage as the school, but it has six offices built into it, whereas the school is one big open area. I wish I had some pictures I'd show you because I wanted one to look like one way and the other to look like the other. So that is called tenant improvement. These are the major alterations that have to be met for a commercial or industrial property needs. Typically, whatever the tenant wants to do has to be drawn out on plans and shown and approved by the landlord because you don't want to go, well, actually, I'm building a sky lab and I'm going to rip the ceiling out. No, the landlord's going to go, no, dude, we can't do that. So even though it's done by the tenant, it typically has to be approved by the landlord. The last thing here is dealing with environmental concerns. And there are all kinds of environmental concerns. There's some true environmental issues like lead-based paint, especially if you are renting out residential properties like an apartment or a double. Those still fall under the federal lead-based paint law disclosure. There could be sick building syndrome, you know, mold in the vents that gets everybody in the building sick. You could have recycling issues, not on this list, but is really common is trash. How does the trash get picked up? Because I now have five tenants that are in a strip center and I've got to get all their trash removed. So as a property manager, you may strike a deal with a trash collection company that comes every Monday and the Tenants have to take their trash bags out and they put them in the dumpster and then the truck comes and picks them up. There could be other issues like insects. And I bring that one up because I've lived that. We were managing a property, a single family home for a client 
who had moved out of state. They tried to sell their house. They couldn't. So they ended up deciding they were just going to rent it, but they were the mom and pop and did not have the ability or the wherewithal. So they hired us. Now, typically we don't like doing or taking an investor that has one property. Really not that beneficial. We like that economies of scale. However, this person was a friend of my parents. So I said, yes, we'll do that. Well, the tenant called me about the third day and said, hey, dude, we've got about a thousand funnel spiders in this house all over. It is infested with spiders. And I said, the only logical thing that could be said, <laughs> burn the house down. <laughs> I don't do spiders, man. I'll do snakes. I'll do cockroaches. I'll do rats. I'll do all that. I don't do spiders. So we had to call a pest company and go, hey, man, uh, good luck. So that could be something that's not on this list, but that would still fall under an environmental issue. Trash, insects, you know, all of that. All of those things are going to be something that you are going to be liable for. Now, we've kind of touched on this a little bit already, is the Americans with Disability Act, the ADA. The ADA applies to employers that they have 15 or more employees. Now, do not be confused in this. What this doesn't say, if there is a complaint filed, they will come out even if your place only has four employees. 15 or more is the kind of the de minimis trigger for automatic inspections. And the ADA has a couple of uh, different acts that we apply to. Remember, one has to do with a reasonable uh, modifications for your employees. You have to use reasonable modifications. And Title III is the access to public goods. As a property manager, you are also going to have to abide by the Equal Credit Opportunity Act. Now, we have mentioned this in a previous chapter. I want to restructure it again because I want you to see. Let's go back and visit. In the fair housing, we have race, color, religion, national origin, sex, family status, and disability. Those are the seven protected classes in the Fair Housing Act. We are going to talk about the Equal Credit Opportunity Act. It is slightly different. It has eight protected classes. Now, I want you to watch me on this. Because this is not a simple math problem. It's not seven plus one to get eight. You would think that would be the smart way. No, it is take the seven in fair housing. They take away two of them and add three new ones back to get to eight. So we have race, color, religion, national origin, sex, and then these two go away. And we have marital status. We have age. And we have dependence on public assistance. Those are the eight protected classes. Now, to me, this seems kind of funny because it looks like the fact that they did not mention these two, that it would be okay to discriminate on them. You would think that the government agency would have said, look, there's seven in the fair housing. Let's add three new ones and make 10. But no, they had seven, took away two, added three new ones. Race, color, religion, national origin, sex, marriage or marital status, meaning they cannot ask if two guys go in to get in a, a loan and the lender can't ask, are you guys married? Can't do that. Age. They can't use your age against you. 
dude, you are 80 years old and you want a 30 year mortgage? Really? Can't do that. And if they are getting any sort of public assistance. So those are the eight protected classes when dealing with the FAIR or dealing with the Equal Credit Opportunity Act. Anybody that's extending credit has to use those or can't use those, has to be cognizant of the fact that they cannot use those as part of the determining factor. The same thing holds true in the fair housing, back to the seven that we had, all right? Do not forget that you are not allowed to practice anything that would constitute blockbusting or steering, meaning, hey, dude, you can't, you don't want to be here because this is not where the Martians live. You want to live over there where the Martians live. That's a violation. 